do it, but you can't find it. Well, welcome to the uh, the July program meeting. I, I think we've got a really neat meeting today, and you know, I've kind of got an agenda here. I think everybody go, ought to go up to Flagstaff and see Lowell Observatory. And after you've heard Kevin, I think you'll feel the same way. Uh, the The picture is of the twenty four inch Clark, and that is available. I think most evenings, and it's pretty amazing to get a view of the of our familiar objects with a with a great classic refractor and it's just recently been refurbished as well okay you don't want to do that our calendar is busy as it always is uh all i th i think we're good for stars at sycamore canyon uh this friday and of course we have a public star party at tds and kq ranch at the same time uh, I just want to, rather than, you know, preaching all of the announcements, want to go down to the 22nd of August. That is the SPIE reception star party downtown at the convention center. It's kind of a neat uh, thing to do because the SPAA is the International Society for Optics and Photonics. There are PhD <laughs> opticians from all around the world, and you get to talk to the you know, the French and the Spanish and the Germans and maybe even some Russians are still available. Uh, convention center is not perfect, uh, but it still is fun. There'll be food and drinks and I think Saturn will be visible in the east. So so we'll have something to, to see. And of course, we're bringing back the great Julian Starfest on the 26th and 7th of August. And, you know, thanks to the team who did that, but, you know, we're back at Julian. There'll be the camping uh, Palomar is still closed for visitors, so we will do a tour of Mount Laguna Observatory as a substitute for that. But yeah, if you if you haven't gotten the word about that, want to volunteer and help out, it's and there is the great public star party on Saturday, and we normally have a thousand people. So yeah, a, a big highlight of our year, and I'm glad to see it back. Uh, I like to put out some. Unusual astronomy news uh, is in a nod to Lowell. Pluto is reaching its brightest. Uh, it's near the third quarter moon in Mars. So, you know, you know, maybe you can try to get into the star party when it's dark. Uh, in a nod to Apple TV, two startup space companies, uh, uh, and one of them is blocked by the by the participants, Relativity Space and Impulse Space are going to try a commercial mission to Mars in 2024. And that would be uh, earlier than the SpaceX mission. Uh, it would be expensive. It's probably technically feasible. I don't know if we resolve the impact of the human body on for long duration space travel and whether the people are ever coming back. But anyway, these, these are pretty ambitious plans. And uh, Caltech uh, Owens Valley Radio Observatory has got a whole new project. And it, they're gonna start by using their 10.4 meter uh, radio dish uh, to go back and look at the early stages of galaxy assembly in, in RF wavelengths. Uh, hopefully that'll complement James Webb. And I know we've all seen the great pictures from James Webb and Oud and Odd and, about that, so there's no sense in bringing that out. All right. I like to show an ASIC picture. This time, I'm just shameless. This is one that Ed and I got uh, back on the 25th of June at TDS. Uh, it only has two hours of data because, you know, if you've seen this work, we're kind of like the Keystone astronomers. So we took an hour's worth of bad data. And then we got two hours worth of, of pretty good data. Uh, the, mount, the night was extraordinary uh, for TDS. And this is, shows you what you can do with one of these wide field cameras, the White Cat 51. It obviously processed and picks insight uh, with a little bit of touch up in Photoshop, which we can't resist. And I don't like to saturate colors a whole lot. And, I could have knocked the stars down just a little bit, but I still think this is pretty good. If you try getting too much color and saturating it, 
then you get some ugly purples. Okay. So that brings us to the, the heart of the evening. Uh, Kevin Schindler from Lowell Observatory uh, is here to give us a presentation. He is the historian and public affairs officer at Lowell, and he's been there for 27 years. He's written seven books, numerous magazine and newspaper articles on a whole variety of subjects. And he has a biweekly astronomy column in the Arizona Daily Sun newspaper. And just as a fun fact, he has both a fossil crab and an asteroid named after him. He didn't start out as an astronomer. I think you were a paleobiologist or something like that. Yeah, so. one, one, I don't know, several presidents ago. <laughs> that, that's how we get the crab. But uh, uh, he's just an amazing speaker. And he hosted a great Palomar docent trip uh, for a good number of us, I think five or six years ago. And the upper left, that's me with the white hair uh, looking through the 24 inch Clark, which is just a great thing to do. And in the lower right, that's Gene Mueller, who is one of the uh, night assistants at Palomar. And that's Kevin in the background, by the way, with the short hair. And yeah. <laughs> she is, she's holding up the, the Pluto discovery plate. I think there's one of them at, in, in the Lola archives and the others in the Smithsonian. And uh, by the way, I think I posed a question on Facebook. Does anybody know what honor Kevin and Jean Mueller have both received? Any, or, I guess they're all muted, aren't they? Well, they both have asteroids named after them. And that was our group. And you'll see some familiar people from SDAA. Uh, Ed is there at the top left, Mark Lane. I'm there with Katie, there are a whole number of us. And we just had a great time. They, they treated us so nicely. And Kevin took us everywhere in the, uh, at Lowell. So with that, Modest introduction, let me turn the meeting over to Kevin to discuss Lowell Observatory's history, current events, outreach, future. Uh, it's just a wonderful place. Uh, Kevin, it's, it's yours. Okay, thanks so much, Ken, and thanks everybody for joining the program tonight. And yeah, I see familiar faces from the tour um, that was here, and, and we'll keep that an open invitation for you to come back because You'll see as I go through the program later on, some of the changes going on here, um, some of the additions of things, including a new visitor facility, which is opening in two years. That's gonna be about six times more square footage than the current one, because we're, we've expanded so much. We have um, so many visitors coming in. So anyways, it's great to, I, I love these things. It's great to share a little observatory with people who have an interest. And, and I thought I'd mention that, that picture with Jean, I just saw her several weeks ago. She was here at the observatory. Um, we had a, a, a kind of a celebration of life for Carolyn Shoemaker. Oh, and, nice. Yeah, so, so um, Jean came over from California and there was family from overseas. It was kind of, a, it had to be limited to a hundred people. So there were about a hundred, but it was really neat to hear um, scientists that had worked with Carolyn and Jean, uh, many here in Flagstaff, as well as family members. And um, um, Apollo 17 astronaut Jack Schmidt was here um, because he worked with the shoemakers. And it was a really nice, nice event. And I mean, Carolyn just passed away last year. Um, and she was, I can't remember, 90, 91, something like that. But up until the end, she was still active and still. Um, even in COVID, was able to participate in a couple of events and everything. So, it really had a it really had a Palomar feel. David Levy was here. Um, it had a Palomar feel to it um, because you know a lot of it was you know talk about Shoemaker Levy nine. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a really a really neat thing. And Ken, you had mentioned that one picture um, that had Jean in it and me with shorter hair. Um, and I I do need a haircut, <laughs> but but that that other plate. You're right, um, there are two discovery, uh, Pluto discovery plates because they took 
a picture one day, waited several days, re-photographed the same area, and then compared those two and look for you know motion of objects. And that's and so there are two discovery plates. And the one um, we had one here for since the discovery, but in the 1970s, the other one was sent to the new Air and Space Museum. Uh, Michael Collins was the director. We've got the letter of agreement signed by Michael Collins, the, oh, uh, who on this date, 53 years ago, uh, was circling around the moon as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were about to walk on the moon. In fact, in let's see, 34 minutes, 34 minutes will be 53 years to the to the day to the minute that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, 7:56. Um, PM our time. So anyways, um, that that Pluto plate, um, just a couple of years ago, uh, the, the Smithsonian was redoing exhibits and decided to return the Pluto plate after 50 years. So, so it was sent back here and we also had the Blink Comparator over on display there for five years. And so the Blink Comparator came back, the second Pluto plate came back and and, and for the first time in 50 years, the two plates you know, got together. It's kind of like a, I don't know, a family reunion of sorts. So, so the next time you come and visit, um, we can show you both of the plates side by side. I um, mean, they're no longer in that plate vault, um, but they're in our archive building. Um, so, and eventually uh, that plate vault that many of you saw with just the rows and rows of glass plates, um, we've started a project to scan all those I'm starting with, with the Planet X search plates um, and, and the scanning is gonna be quite the project because um, they're, they're gonna scan both the envelope that the plate's in as well as the plate, but then erase any marks that were made on the plate that, that the astronomers added like Clay Tamba when he wrote notes about different objects and then rescan what the original plate looked like. So we have digital version of both the, the pre-notated plate as well as the one with notations. And then the plates will get moved over to, to the other building. So at some point on a future visit when you come, some of those plates may already have been moved or all of them, I'm not sure. It, I, you know, I'm excited about it because it means that all that information will be available digitally. Um, um, but it's also kind of sad because if you're in that plate vault, it's kind of a magical feel because it's this, you know, this room in the basement in the bowels of the observatory and just these rows of plates that represent several different careers. Um, and I, it's just phenomenal to stand in that room. Um, and, you know, it's interesting with those plates because, you know, it's a historic record of what the sky was like. And certainly uh, Palomar has, has the great plate collection there. Um, but, you know, that stuff is still useful when, the New Horizons mission was flying, was preparing to fly by Pluto. It, was, it already launched. And when it was nearing getting to Pluto, they, they kept refining um, the spacecraft, tweaking it here and there so it could make the most optimal pass of Pluto. And to, to refine that, they went back on, on all the plates we had of Pluto after the discovery, taken right off the discovery into the 1930s, um, rescanned those. Um, to get a more precise position of Pluto. Um, and then they refined the, the orbit of the, the flight of New Horizons slightly. And so, you know, that, that old data is still very useful. Um, and so to be able to scan it while the plates are still in good condition is really a neat thing. And I, I had a program here too, I should start somewhere along the way. There's just, there's just some, it's just fun to talk about some different things that are going on. And, um, and, and seeing Gene Mueller, I, I have to tell you, I, I met Gene Mueller, my wife and I met her, I can't remember now, it's been maybe 15 years ago. I had just taken over managing the public program here at Lowell Observatory. And so I wanted to go and visit um, the various observatories in California, kind of get a feel, you know, Palomar, Mount Wilson, Lick, um, you know, get a feel for, for what everybody was doing with both science and education. And so I was talking to Carolyn Shoemaker one day and she said, oh, let me give you a number. This lady's name is Jean Mueller. Um, I bet she'll be glad to show you around. 
So I contacted Jean and before the phone call was over, she had invited us to stay with her um, in, where she was living, which at one time had been Fritz Wiki's house. Um, and so, so we went to Pelomar, we never met her and we ended up staying there, became fast friends. She introduced us to dark chocolate and port wine, I think it was. And, um, and it was great because she was on the, on the 200 inch that night. And so we walked her over to the dome and then just kind of had the rest of the night to just kind of poke around and enjoy being at the observatory. It was really, it was really fun. And thus began a long friendship with Jean and, and others at Palomar Observatory, um, people with connections there, Scott Cardell, um, you mentioned um, a couple other people before. And so it's really, it's really great for us at Lowell Observatory to be able to talk with you guys. So let me, let me actually start my program before I run out of time here. Um, just a second. So one more thing. Okay, in theory, you should see a title slide. Is that, is, are you guys seeing that? Okay, Good. great. So I, I suspect that most of you who are watching this could probably give a pretty decent program about Lowell Observatory um, because you're interested in astronomy and historic observatories and such and have been here. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to do a blow by blow of stuff that you already know, but I thought I would get kind of an overview, some of the highlights of the observatory, and then um, talk about some of the outreach that's happening here, and then our plans for the future of outreach. Um, because in, in just two years, we'll be opening our new astronomy discovery center, a 40,000 square foot um, facility. So if we, if we talk about Lowell Observatory somewhere, we have to introduce this guy, uh, Percival Lowell, uh, from the very wealthy family, the Lowells of Massachusetts. And I, I think, you know, I've been here at Lowell for 27 years now. And in, in studying him through the years, one thing that I've come to realize is when I first started working here, I thought, okay, why, why was this guy, he got interested in astronomy. He was, in fact, his earliest recollection was when he was three years old, seeing Donati's Comet of 1858. Um, and that kind of, he was always interested in astronomy. He went to school for mathematics at Harvard, but he did a senior thesis on astronomy and went overseas, worked, worked for the family business in textiles for years, and then went overseas and immersed himself in Eastern culture for years um, and became very well known for this. And he wrote several books based on his experiences in Korea and Japan. And in fact, today, he's still well remembered. In fact, one of our um, consultants that we're working with at the observatory, Ian McClellan, who some of you may know, he, um, had, he goes over to Japan periodically. And he was there a couple of years ago and he brought me back this cookie container that had a picture of Percival Lowell on it. Um, and all this, all this time later, 100 and, gosh, 125 years after he was last there, Percival Lowell is still remembered as one of the first Westerners to really immerse himself in Eastern culture um, and write books about it. And so, you know, Lowell had this interest in the Orient and then he came back to the United States in 1893 and suddenly decided to build an observatory. Um, he had a lifelong interest in astronomy, but he, he became interested in Mars and the work of Giovanni Schiaparelli and and the canal, canale that he found in 1877, the supposed linear features. Um, and, and I've always wondered since I was here, you know, what drove Percival Lowell? He, he, he actually was on his way to a good career as a orientalist, but then he switched gears, came back to the United States and went into astronomy. And what I found is, it, I think it's all family, Percival Lowell, came from a very well-established blue blood family of, of New England. And if you were a Lowell, you were expected to do something important. There were judges, um, military generals, uh, lawyers, writers, poets. And just as an example, 
of the success of their family, uh, Percival, Percival's siblings, he was the oldest. Um, he had one brother, Abbott, who was president of Harvard for 24 years. And there were three sisters. One married a relative of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, one married our current trustees, great, um, great grand or great uncle, um, William Lowell Putnam. And the Putnams are, if, if you ever see Putnam County, there are several states that have Putnam County or Putnam, that's the Putnam family, um, very connected to the Lowells. And then the third sister was Amy Lowell who won a Pulitzer Prize for poetry. That's just one generation. That's a pretty darn successful family. And Percival Lowell was the oldest. And I think, I think um, the relationship he had with his father um, combined with this expectation is we really what drove him um, so passionately to not only you know, go overseas and study Korea and Japan, but to start the observatory um, and that drove him beyond maybe even, I hate to say common sense, but in some cases logic to propose these ideas of life on Mars to search for a new planet. Because I think, you know, as a Lowell, he was so driven, he had to succeed. But then there was the fact that he was the oldest. And, and evidence suggests that his relationship with his father was not real strong. It was much better with his mother because as the oldest, he was expected to carry on the family mantle, to stay in Boston, to, to be the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce president, to, to be the business leader, um, to be involved with civic organizations. He wasn't interested in that. He was a wanderlust. After going overseas, you know, he decided to start his observatory out here in the West. Um, he didn't want to be the oldest. His brother did that. And I think, I think some insecurities because he was the oldest, but he wasn't doing what was expected, plus the fact that he was a Lowell is what really drove him passionately. Um, he, he started the observatory not to do basic astronomy research and to incrementally increase our knowledge. He started the observatory to make a major discovery that would carry on the Lowell name. And that was to prove that there was intelligent life on Mars. Um, when that was failing, um, and, and he spent years looking at Mars and, and drawing the supposed canals and such, when that failed, um, or while he was doing that, whoops, while he was doing that, um, he started to look for planet, um, what he, that he called Planet X. Again, this wasn't doing some sort of you know, nightly observation, looking at the change of atmosphere of Jupiter, for instance. This was to make a major discovery. If he can't prove there's intelligent life on, on Mars, if he discovers a new planet in our solar system, that's big. That's going to carry on the name. And I think, I think that's what really drove him. Um, he, wanted, he wanted to do something big. And so he decides to set up the observatory. And in talking to the Pickering brothers at, at Harvard College Observatory, realized that if he's gonna start an observatory, doing it in the Boston area in his hometown is probably not a good idea because this is the late 1800s, the industrial revolution. There's a lot of smoke from factories, including his family's factories. Um, and also you think about electric lights. By the eight, late 1800s, electricity is becoming commonplace. That means there's more and more outdoor street lights, which is shining light up. And, and Lowell realized that if he's gonna build an observatory, he has to get away from, from the, the traditional sites for observatories, which were universities and cities. So he decided to go out west um, where, you know, maybe he finds a place where there isn't electricity and artificial lights and no smoke um, pollution. So he, he hired an assistant, Andrew Douglas, and Andrew Douglas is a great story in his, in his own right. He helped Percival Lowell found the observatory here. He had a falling out with Percival Lowell when he questioned um, the veracity of Lowell's claims um, and trying to do it in a nice way, but um, it didn't work out for him. But then he went down to Tucson 
and founded the Stewart Observatory and also founded the science of dendrochronology. So uh, his story is fascinating in itself. But, but Lowell hired Douglas in 1894 to take this six inch refractor, um, shown in this picture, and we still have this. We have this in our collection center, to take it out to Arizona territory. And this is, this is 18 years before Arizona is even a state. So this is really the Wild West. Take it out to Arizona, test different sites around the territory, um, testing for not only the quality of seeing at nighttime with a telescope, but also take various um, um, weather instruments to, to look at um, weather patterns and climate and such. And so Douglas went around Tombstone, Tucson, Tempe, and the last place he tested was Flagstaff. And um, this was only over the course of a few weeks. If you're gonna do site testing in today's world, you do site testing over a year or two to see year long patterns and such. But first of all, Lowell's in a hurry. The conditions in Flagstaff were decent, not great necessarily, but decent. So Lowell said, just set it up in Flagstaff. And I mean, the conditions here were good, but they, I'm convinced that if Douglas had started in Northern Arizona and headed down South and ended in Tucson, there's a good chance Lowell Observatory would have been established there. Um, a combination of comparable weather patterns, but Lowell was in a hurry. He was, <laughs> set it up, let's get it going. You're in Flagstaff, conditions are fine, let's do it there. So he set the observatory up. Um, and, and the rest is history. We'll talk about some of that right now. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, when we think back on Percival Lowell, as we're going through this program, I think one interesting thing keep, to keep in mind is that he started the observatory to do something big. He wanted to prove there's intelligent life on Mars. He didn't do it. He wanted to, he wanted to discover a new planet. He didn't do it. Even though, unbeknownst to him, one of his staff photographed Pluto um, when Percival Lowell was still alive, they didn't realize it till long after Percival Lowell was dead. <clears throat> after Clyde Tumba discovered Pluto, they went back on the old plates and found it on a couple of these plates. So Lowell, his team had photographed it. He could have discovered Pluto, but, he, but they didn't detect it. Um, so I think Percival Lowell went to his grave probably unfulfilled because he didn't make this great mark. And yet in hindsight, I think he made a greater contribution than he could have imagined. Um, you know, if he had discovered a planet, that would have been big. But what he did was establish an observatory that through the years ebbs and flows like other places, but, is, but through the years really in the scientific output has thrived, um, including some discoveries we'll talk about in a few minutes. But, you know, if, if it wasn't for Percival Lowell, Pluto wouldn't have discovered, been discovered probably, I don't know, 1980s or later, um, because that kind of search nobody was doing. It, you know, there's nothing out there, astronomers thought. Um, and so many other things that Lowell, in the, at, the at the time, didn't realize what their long-term impact would be. Another one of these is dark skies. He, he came to Flagstaff specifically um, because he was looking for dark skies and clear skies, skies clear from, clear from smoke and from light. Well, that kind of set a precedent. Flagstaff has these dark skies. In 1958, when the observatory, uh, Lowell Observatory here, um, we were looking to acquire a new telescope, a larger telescope to kind of keep up with the standards of the times. And we acquired a um, the 72 inch Perkins telescope from Ohio Wesleyan. And in looking for a site to set it up, by that time, the, the historic site of the observatory wasn't ideal anymore because, because flags have grown. There are, now, there are now city lights, there's light pollution, not horrible, but, but bad enough for, you know, it's a big new telescope. And so they found a site a dozen miles outside of town, but there's one problem. Um, on some nights, you could see, see searchlights from out there. A dozen miles away, you could see these searchlights. So one of, one of the um, Lowell astronomers, E.C. Slifer, he had been very active in the Flagstaff community for years. At one time, he was the mayor of Flagstaff. So he had a lot of connections in the community. And, and 
as they were learning about these, these searchlights, he talked to his friends on city council and said, hey, can we do something to kind of limit the use of these street lights so we can do good astronomy? Maybe, you know, turn them off after 10 p.m. or, you know, whatever on the details. And the city council created an ordinance. Um, this was 1958. As it turns out, this was the first artificial light ordinance, outdoor artificial light ordinance, not in our country, but in the entire world. The, the first one was right here. And that really set the stage for Flagstaff as a dark sky community. Um, through the years, Flagstaff um, continued to um, add on and enhance the, the, um, the laws. And then the county has also made regulations to the point that in 2001, the International Dark Sky um, Association named Flagstaff as the world's first international dark sky city. So this is one of these things that Percival Lowell had the foresight to go to a site that was dark, but he had, I don't think any concept of down the road that Flagstaff would be a model community for dark skies. And, and of course now today this goes well beyond astronomy as we find out other negative impacts of, of artificial light besides um, you know, just, just for looking at the stars. So I think that's just one example of, of a result of Percival Lowell's that you know, he, he really was successful, not in ways he imagined, um, but in different ways. So let's talk about the, some of the science done through the years. Um, you know, if you know anything about Lowell, of course, you know about Percival Lowell and his ideas about you know, life on Mars. And he was such an eloquent speaker and a gifted writer that he really inspired people. He inspired scientists, some to want to prove, to, that agreed with him to want to prove that there was life there. Uh, most astronomers doubted it and they wanted to disprove him. He also had some negative impact. There were some scientists that shied away from planetary studies because Percival Lowell was making a mess of it um, in their eyes. And so, so there, it's interesting to look back and see see what his impact on planetary studies was. Um, so he did this, did this work with um, planetary studies. And I, I think another one of the important things that Lowell did was to bring on um, assistants who turned out to be brilliant scientists and, and really served this kind of foundation of 20, 20th century science. Um, one of these was VM Slifer, Vesto Slifer shown here, I mentioned his brother, E.C. Earl Slifer. Earl Slifer uh, became a, a master photographer. He was one of the first astronomers to use the technique we would today call image stacking, in which he used, um, gathered a lot of images. And so one time E.C. Slifer had took more images of Mars than anybody else in the world. Well, his brother, V.M. Slifer, as most of you probably know, um, longtime astronomer here, um, but he he did he, his brother even better. Um, Percival Lowell wanted wanted Slifer to learn how to use this spectrograph attached to the base of the 24 inch refractor, and initially he wanted him him to look at the rotation of planets like Venus, which was controversial if it was fast rotation or slow. Um, and and then Lowell asked him to look at these fuzzy blobs in space that they were called spiral nebulae at the time. And Percival Lowell, uh, who, who was looking to prove that there was intelligent life on Mars, um, he was looking, part of the supporting evidence for this was to prove that there, the conditions on Mars were right for intelligent life. And so he wanted to prove that there was oxygen and, and water and such there. So he wanted VM Slifer to point this at Mars um, to study it, um, and he did this. And he also wanted him to, VM Slifer, to look at these fuzzy blobs, these spiral nebulae, because in Lowell's thinking, um, what he called the evolution of planets or planetology, um, in that planets, like organic things, evolved. They were born, they go through life cycles, and they die. And he thought that um, these spiral nebulae were young planetary systems, um, like, like pre-Jupiters and pre-Saturns. And so he thought, um, okay, VM Slifer, I want you to 
look at these objects with the spectrograph, get their spectra. And if the spectra, if the elements match what um, we find in Jupiter or Saturn, then that might prove that the spiral nebulae are protoplanetary systems if they show the same elements. Well, Slipher didn't find that. Um, they were different, it didn't match up. But as what he did find was that these things were moving in general at incredible speeds away from us, well beyond what anybody expected. And this was the first empirical evidence, the first observations of the expanding universe. Um, and Slipher did it because he was using techniques that nobody ever you know, thought you should even try because he would take, <laughs> it's amazing what he did. He, he took these spectra, some of them several dozen hours, 30 or 40 hours where he would um, get the telescope and the, and the spectrograph uh, pointed at one of these spiral nebulae, track it throughout the entire evening until it's set, close down the telescope, and then the next day, move the telescope back to where that object was rising again, open the telescope and continue his, his exposure for another night. Um, and he did this so we could, because these things are so faint. Nobody had done anything like this. I mean, astronomers had done spectra of stars, certainly, but of galaxies, what's the point? They're so faint, we can't see anything. Slipher did these, these dozens of hours long exposures that were really painstaking. But, but that's how he discovered the expanding universe. Um, and then of course, Edwin Hubble came along. This was one component. VM Slipher detected that these things were moving at incredible speeds in general, um, redshifting. But Edwin Hubble came along and used those observations along with his own and other astronomers to, to, to come up with a theory about it, the, the expanding universe. Um, so, so again, First of all, Lowell didn't hire VM Slipher to discover you know, the redshift. He hired him as a, as a favor to a friend at Indiana University with the idea that you know, if he likes it here, great. If not, fine, he can find a career elsewhere. And Slipher spent his whole career here and made one of the fundamental discoveries of the 20th century. I mentioned that, that Percival Lowell believed that there was another planet out there. Um, in 1902, he gave a series of lectures at MIT um, talking about his ideas of how the solar system formed and evolved. And in it, in those, he, he talked about how he believed there's a nice planet out there based on the um, concentrations of meteor showers as well as the behavior of comets. And he published this in a book called The Solar System. And then in 1905, he began searching for this theoretical planet. And he soon got away from looking at the behavior of comets and meteor showers. And today we know that those ideas were, were just wrong, but he focused on the, the unexplained perturbations of Uranus and some of Neptune and, and made predictions on where this planet would be located. Um, he, he died in 1916 before discovering it. But like I said, he, his team had actually photographed Pluto and he didn't know it. Um, what's ironic is that um, a decade later after he died, the observatory had new leadership and they decided, you know, Uncle Percy was onto something, that the observatory was in the doldrums for years, let's energize it by recommencing the search. And if we can find Uncle Percy's planet, and so many people around him here call him Uncle Percy because it's a family operation of sorts. His great grandnephew is our sole trustee today. So it's, you know, we talk about Percival Lowell here. If you hear Uncle Percy, um, that you can, it's probably somebody who works here. And so they thought, you know, if we discover his planet, that'll get Lowell Observatory back on track. Well, they hired 23 year old Clyde Tamba, who within a year discovered Pluto pretty darn close to where Percival Lowell thought it should be. In fact, Clyde was looking in that specific area um, based on Percival Lowell's um, predictions. And as we know today, um, Clyde Tomba did not discover Percival Lowell's Planet X, which he predicted was this really big planet tugging on Uranus and Neptune. Clyde Tomba just happened to find <laughs> this small body that we know today as Pluto 
in the location where Percival Wool thought the big planet should be. Um, and so it's a, you know, this great example of, of serendipity in science. Um, there were, I mean, Clyde Tombo was systematically, painstakingly surveying the sky. And it wouldn't have been discovered without that painstaking survey, but he happened to find it pretty close to where Percival Lowell thought a planet should be. So just a, a great part of the story of Pluto. And the story of Pluto doesn't end there at the observatory though, through the years. Uh, there, I mean, there were decades where much, not much was learned about Pluto. It was a, even through the biggest telescopes, it was dot, a dot. Um, but then um, in the 19, in the 1980s, um, astronomers here at Lowell were involved in, involved in occultation studies. And a team of astronomers, including some here at Lowell Observatory, and in fact, the head of this program was named Jim Elliott. He was at MIT, and I'm sitting in his office. Um, he was at MIT, but he, he spent summers here at the observatory. He brought classes every January. He brought an astronomy class here. And when he worked here, this was his office. And he passed away several years ago, but I was lucky enough to be able to um, be in his office. So anyways, they, they in 1988, discovered uh, Pluto's atmosphere. Um, and then if we keep jumping forward to the 1990s, an um, astronomer named Mark Bowie, who is now at Southwest Research Institute where Alan Stern is and a lot of other Pluto um, scientists, he made the first detailed maps of Pluto. And these are just albedo maps looking at darker and lighter areas. But when New Horizons flew by um, and we got those exquisite pictures, they matched up well with Mark Bowie's maps. And one of our scientists, and I don't know um, his name is Will Grundy. I don't know if he's spoken to your group before, but I'd be glad to put you in contact with him because he was the uh, one of the team leaders, the surface composition team for New Horizons. And, and so he was um, one of the leaders of the New Horizons project and um, is still involved with New Horizons as well as other missions. Um, but, but through that, it, you know, you think about major discoveries of Pluto from early searches to its discovery, to its five moons, some of the moons, its atmosphere, the first maps, New Horizons, all of those have some sort of tie to Northern Arizona and Lowell Observatory. Um, so it really is kind of Pluto Town USA with all these different um, connections. And you know, to me, I think it's humorous when we talk to the public, of course, one of the first questions is, is Pluto a planet? Why do they dump Pluto? Are you guys doing okay? They took Pluto away. Um, there's all sorts of great questions we get from the public. And from my perspective, it's always been, boy, this is great. Because the, you know, the controversy with Pluto has people interested um, and, it, and it brings visitors here to wanna to learn more. So whether you know most planetary scientists consider Pluto a planet, um, most, non-planetary scientists, it seems, um, say it's not a planet. Um, and then if it's a dwarf planet, is that a type of planet? Uh, you guys know the, all the arguments with this and everything. But for my part, it reinforces how um, the heritage of Pluto is so well tied to, to Flagstaff and Lowell Observatory that people around the world come here to learn about Pluto and try to, try to understand what the controversy is. So, so Pluto is a heritage thing for us, but it, it's a heritage that goes back nearly more than 100 years now um, when the early searches started and continues today. And, and here's kind of the evolution of Pluto from you know, the dot to the really spectacular Hubble images. Uh, I mean, by today's standard, and then of course, New Horizons. Uh, you know, in, a, in the course of less than 100 years, Pluto has gone from a dot to a world. So let's talk about some other research at, at Lowell Observatory through the years. Um, one, one of the probably unknown or lesser known projects here, um, but one of the most important, had its start with Clyde Tombaugh's work searching for Planet X. Because he photographed over 75% of the, of the sky, so a couple decades after this, an astronomer named Henry Gicklis 
decided to start a crop promotions um, program in which he and his team would rephotograph the sky, compare the new plates to those that Clyde Tomba had done and note the, the motion of the stars and how they changed over time and the proper motion. And so Henry Gicklis has started this program and just when he was starting it, there was this newspaper account from a young, um, not too long out of high school, this guy down in Prescott who had discovered a comet. And it was all over the newspapers. And it turns out this guy, his mom was very um, active in writing letters to newspapers and such. And so when her son discovered a comet, she wanted to make sure everybody knew. Um, and so Henry Gicklis met this guy and took him out to lunch and said, I need help with this proper motion survey. I need somebody to do photography and then to analyze this through a blink comparator, would you be interested? And the guy said yes and hired him. And for the next 20 years, he worked at the Lowell Observatory on the proper motion survey. Um, his name is Robert Burnham Jr. And uh, most of you, I suspect if we were to ask who has a copy of Burnham's Celestial Handbook on their bookshelf, that the majority of hands would probably go up. Um, because even though that handbook is now, some of the, some of the data is outdated, th there's still, it's a spectacular <laughs> reference. Um, Burnham was a fascinating personality because there is some sort of personality disorder um, and his, his, his only living relative is niece. Um, in fact, she's gonna be coming doing a program next month. It's a panel discussion with, it's gonna be her astronomy historian, Bill Sheehan, who's also a retired psychiatrist, Tony Ortega, who wrote the defining story of Robert Burnham years ago, and then Brian Skiff, um, who many of you are familiar with him, I'm an astronomer here. Um, this is on August 13th, and it's gonna be both live and live stream, so I can send you a link to it. We're gonna have a panel discussion discussing Robert Burnham and his handbook and everything. Anyways, a, a fascinating character and controversy about his time here at Lowell, his ending time at Lowell. Um, and I think we're getting a, a better understanding of what happened, but he was here for 20 years working on the proper motion survey. And then in his spare time, that's when he would work on the celestial handbook. <laughs> and the result is this 2000 page um, thing that now is in three volumes. Initially, it was a loose leaf um, thing like this. Um, but he was, he was working here at Lowell Observatory and, and so many of the pictures in that handbook, if you look through, were taken with the Pluto Discovery Telescope, the 13 inch refract or 13 inch astrograph. Um, so um, one of the things we're trying to do is build more awareness about Burnham because it was so important to amateur astronomers as, as, as well as professional astronomy. And so we're also creating a display that's gonna be open next month about him. So, I, and, and the San Diego connection as I, I suspect most or many of you know, is that after he left Lowell, he, he lived with family for a while in Arizona and then he disappeared. Family didn't know what happened to him, um, no word from him. And then years later, the son of an astronomer he worked with, um, the astronomer was Norm Thomas, so his son Bruce was out in California visiting Balboa Park walking down the whatever walkway and he looked over and my gosh that looks like Robert Burnham he went over and said Bob is that you he was he was selling paintings of cats um that was the end of his life he I mean this brilliant um knew this guy better than anybody he ended up the last years of his life was selling paintings of cats um in Balboa Park and he died at the age of 61 and he's buried at um, Fort Rosecrans Cemetery at Point Loma, I think that's what it's called. Um, and his marker to, to just add insult to injury, his original marker had his name misspelled. <laughs> um, but once family found out about it and that he had ended up there and he died, they, um, they redid the marker. So you out there in San Diego, you can, you can visit that. I think it's the same cemetery where Wally Shiraz, Wally Shira is entombed, the Mercury astronaut. Um, but anyways, 
Maybe somebody can confirm that. So, oh, I, had to, I was gonna check time here. Um, it's 8.01, so 53 years and five minutes ago, Neil Armstrong took the first steps on the moon. And the observatory, I thought we'd talk about this a little bit, the observatory has quite a connection with the moon program. And in fact, Flagstaff um, has a really strong connection to it. Every of the Apollo astronauts who went to the moon trained here in Northern Arizona. Um, they did geology training. They, and this included not only learning how to be geologists, but learning, you know, doing practice mission, mission um, simulations and such. Um, they, and they, they did this work elsewhere, but Flagstaff was a real center for especially um, the geology training. Well, here at Low Observatory, we had a moon mapping program going on from 1961 to 63, where we had airbrush artists like Patricia Bridges on the right, working with scientists to create detailed maps of the moon because we didn't have any. And you know, if we're gonna send people to the moon, we should have detailed maps of the surface to figure out where to land and so on. And so the um, airbrush artists created these exquisitely detailed maps. And this is a close up of one map, Copernicus. And I mean, this is, this is artwork, um, and, but they're extremely accurate. If you compare it to modern maps of the moon, they're, they're so accurate. And they did this all using airbrushes. So everything done here was originally drawn with an airbrush. And even the shadows were created um, for to um, an assumption of a certain sun angle, the same sun angle as when the astronauts would be you know, flying over there. And so the, this mapping went on for years at the observatory. Um, and it was just one of many things here in Flagstaff. Um, that, this picture is just a few days old. Um, just a few days ago, I took a former colleague, Bill Buckingham, who just recently stepped down as Kit Peak's public program um, educator. We went out here and visited this crater field. Um, NASA worked with the USGS to create a simulated lunar surface, um, not necessarily the exact material, although it was volcanic rock, but they wanted to create a surface that had a bunch of different craters. So the astronauts could practice walking through them, driving the rovers through them and such. And I, the next time you're here, I'd love to take you out to this place. This field is more than 50 years old and the craters are still very well preserved uh, where the astronauts trained. There are actually a couple of different crater fields here. So they, they not only studied places like Meteor Crater, um, this is Gene Shoemaker, the geologist who was head of the training for years. They went to Meteor Crater and the Grand Canyon. Here's um, Jim Lovell. Um, Another moonwalker, Pete Conrad, John Young, and Tom Stafford orbited the moon on Apollo 10. Um, so they went to natural features like Meteor Crater and um, Sunset Crater, Grand Canyon. They created these artificial fields um, and the mapping that was going on here at the observatory. And this is here at Lowell with the astronomer I mentioned, E.C. Slifer. And here's Tom Stafford and Neil Armstrong looking at some of the maps. Um, and in fact, there's a great kind of completing the circle. Um, the, the astronauts came here for this training. In some cases, they were here within a week or two, a couple of weeks of their missions doing final training. Well, um, almost 50 years ago, 49 years later, on the observatory, we built our new Lowell Discovery Telescope and had first light in 2012. And so on July, 21st, 2012, so um, whatever, 10 years ago tomorrow, we had a big gala and our guest speaker was Neil Armstrong. Um, and so 49 years after he was here to train, he returned to help us dedicate this new telescope. And this turned out actually to be his last public appearance because he passed away just a couple weeks after that. So we've got this really strong connection um, to the moon and, and especially on a night tonight where we look back and celebrate and for those of us who were around at that time trying you know remembering where we were when they landed and took those first steps you know I wanted to make sure to talk about that moon stuff a little bit so let's move on a little bit to um, 
sort of more in modern times. I had mentioned before about Jim Elliott and the study of occultations um, and, and the discovery of Pluto. Well, this was done by you setting up telescopes on Earth in different places, especially in Australia, um, but also using airborne observatories, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, and then its descendants, I guess, the um, Sophia. And so um, Lowell astronomers have used both of those um, instrument, those facilities through the years. I even got to fly on Sophia a couple of years back um, when one of our team was doing a project with that. Um, and Sophia is now being going to be mothballed. Um, but I think you know some of the research that was done with it was was really fabulous. It's just such an expensive venture. I mean, a hundred inch telescope operating it on Earth is hard enough, but doing it on a converted 747, um, it's an expensive venture. And so that program's being cut, but it, but it really produced a lot of great science, including the discoveries of rings of Uranus, the discovery of Pluto's atmosphere and, and other stuff like that. So our astronomers have used facilities like the Airborne Observatories, like observatories in South America to look at the southern skies. But our main research facility for years, for the first oh, 50 years of our existence, was right here on Mars Hill, where many of you visited um, a few years back. Um, and then in the 1950s, um, even, even, even with Flagstaff's um, dark skies, when we, when we got that new Perkins telescope, um, we established the dark sky site outside of town, um, and that's called Anderson Mesa, the Anderson Mesa dark sky site. And this site has one, two, three, four traditional telescopes plus an interferometer. Um, and so these have, <coughs> excuse me, these have been operated um, out there. The, the oldest instrument out there is the Perkins telescope, and then others came years later. And so this was the center of our, our research facilities for you know, the middle 50 years or so. And then I mentioned that in 2012, we, we um, saw first light for the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Um, this is a 4.3 meter instrument. And it's not, you know, it's not the largest telescope, certainly. Um, you've got larger ones there. Um, it's 4.3 meter, it's the fifth largest telescope in the continental US. But what makes this so unique and powerful is the configuration. Um, it's got on the base, it's got an instrument cube. Um, and, and you know, telescopes traditionally you can you put an instrument on. Sometimes these things are like the size of a piano. And so say it's a spe <coughs> spectrograph. Um, well, if you want to use a different instrument, you know, it can take a day to take one off and put another one on. You've lost all that time. With the Lowell Discovery Telescope, um, and the, by the way, the primary mirror, if you can see my cursor, there's the mirror right here. And here's the secondary mirror, it's just under two meters. Um, this, at the base, it has what's called an instrument cube. It has five different ports on it, so you can have five different instruments. And so let's say, you know, one of our astronomers, Dave Schleicher, discovers a comet. He wants to study it with, with um, he wants to image it. He wants to use, use a photometer, whatever instrument. Um, they could almost simultaneously use all of those instruments within about 15 seconds. You push a button, the cube changes, the light pattern goes through a different instrument. And so almost simultaneously, you can, study an object with different instruments. And that makes this telescope really powerful. Um, and, and it's our, our uh, main telescope. And we'll, we'll probably be, you know, another 40, 50 years, we'll be talking about another, the next generation telescope. It seems like every 50 years, we, we you know, get the next big thing. So what kind of research is being done with this? Well, we've got, gosh, everything from, Solar, small solar system bodies to um, cannibal galaxies like Michael West's the cannibal galaxy. Um, I think one of the most exciting projects, and I, I, I can't let the cat out of the bag yet, but 
the fellow on the right, Dr. Joe Lama, um, he told me a couple weeks ago that they have a major discovery that they're preparing right now to, for announcement. But Joe Lama and um, Dr. Deborah Fisher of Yale, um, Deborah Fisher has been leading this 100 Earth project. And, and what, they, what they did was build a, a specialized spectroscope that it used in conjunction with the Lowell Discovery Telescope can detect Earth-sized planets. And this is you know, certainly something, exoplanets is a huge topic of research these days. And finding Earth-sized exoplanets is, is gonna really change um, our understanding of, of planetary formation and evolution. And so this is a major project. And again, stay tuned because um, we're supposedly getting some, some sort of news coming pretty soon with that. Um, in addition to telescope viewing um, and observations, um, we also have, um, a, we're kind of connected with Northern Arizona University here, and they have a cryogenics lab in which you can simulate conditions in the outer solar system that we can make observations of frigid places like Pluto and um, outer solar system moons, and then um, create those conditions in the lab to try to understand um, what's going on out there. And so this, this having this lab is really important for kind of connecting the dots. I, I think I want to show you this because I, you know, we talk about the Lowell Discovery Telescope. It was a $53 million project. And, and that um, 100 Earths project with the Yale spectroscope, uh, these, these instruments are not cheap. But then, on the other hand, you can still do some really great science with really inexpensive um, instruments. And, and certainly you amateur astronomers know the kind of discoveries you can make, um, double star research, cometary searches and such, that you don't necessarily need a $53 million telescope. And one example of this, and this is Nick Moskovitz, Dr. Mick, Nick Moskovitz, one of our scientists here, again, somebody I'd be glad to introduce you. He's a great speaker. Um, his specialty is, is asteroids, um, meteoroids. Um, and so one of the projects, he's involved in a lot of different projects. In, in fact, he's involved with the DART mission, um, which will be impacting in September. I think the goal is right now. Um, but one of his projects, and this is part of a network, he's got these boxes that have a dozen or so off the shelf security cameras. And you can see they're all pointed at slightly different areas. And he's got, he's got a box here, and this is the building I'm in. Um, he's got a box, uh, several around Northern Arizona, one at Meteor Crater, a um, couple others around. And all these things do is, is to record the night sky. But what happens is if somebody reports uh, a bolide, bright meteor, um, they can go back on the film um, and find that object, see as it streaks across the sky. And by having ca cameras at different angles, as well as different stations, they can use all those observations to triangulate, look at that pattern of, of the streak. And you know, if it's, if it's bright enough, um, assuming that it hasn't burned up, they can project the landing spot for that, for that object. And they're just starting to have success with this. Um, a couple of years back, they found, um, they were able to find some meteorite remains based on this triangulation. Just earlier, a couple of months ago, I was with Nick and several others at Lowell. We went to New Mexico um, searching for some meteorite fragments. Um, we didn't find any pieces, but it was, it was great because they're refining the technique to where, you know, you see a bright meteor, view it, I look at the videos, track it, go and look for it, and we'll be able to have a pretty accurate estimate of where it's located. So, you know, this is something that, you know, most of the work is done by the computers. The hardware itself is pretty inexpensive. So again, you don't need, you don't need that, that Cadillac necessarily for doing some research, for doing a lot of important research. So, so much, so much great research going on here. I could talk more, but I, I also wanted to talk about the other aspect of Lowell Observatory, 
and that's doing our, the public outreach. Uh, Percival Lowell, our founder, said, you know, what's the point of doing research unless you share it with people and inspire people about the universe around them, as he said, to make them co-discoverers. So, you know, we, we have visitors coming up and we might have a seven-year-old looking through a telescope. He might not be discovering a new planet, but it's new to him. And if that, if that inspires him to want to learn more, um, and if that helps to, for us to have a little bit more of a literate society, huzzah, we, we could really use that. And so from the beginning, public outreach has been part of what we do here at the observatory also. Um, for those of you who are here, you recognize this um, unusual view of the 24 inch refractor taken from above. And this was right after we renovated the telescope in 2014, 15, in which they took everything out, the telescope, everything from this railing up came out, counterweights, um, the telescope and segments and such. And it's really, we have a lot of great pictures of it. It's a really great story. But when, it, when they put it back together, this telescope works better than it ever has, perhaps even better than when Lowell originally had it. Um, but this is this traditionally has been the centerpiece of our visitor experience. Um, and in fact, you know, that I would say this telescope is more responsible for awareness about Lowell than maybe anything, any other single thing here, because it's been, you know. We've had millions of people visit the observatory through the years. And visitors, if you come during the daytime, you get tours of it. If you come at night, you can get to look through it. And it's also been featured on so many, so much scientific programming. Um, starting going back to some of the earliest science programming on TV, um, Walt Disney, um, there, they did a special Tomorrowland special, Mars and Beyond. And this is a still from that special that also featured Werner von Braun talking about traveling to Mars. Well, this is E.C. Slifer, and they have footage. You can get, I, a couple of years ago, you could still get this on DVD, um, but E.C. Slifer talked about Mars as a Mars expert, and um, they went up to the old Clark telescope. Um, the, the telescope is featured in the show. Um, and so, so from, from the early television, some of the first educational programming from Disneyland to, to the original Cosmos, 1980-81. This is a still from one of the episodes of Carl Sagan's Cosmos called Blues for a Red Planet. Um, in the late 1990s, here, here's Leonard Nimoy, who is doing a, a program. He's interviewing Carolyn Shoemaker here. Um, here's some really nerdy looking guy um, with Bill Nye back in the 1990s um, when he was doing his Bill Nye the Science Guy programs. He, he did an episode here. And even to get into pop culture, um, I, I don't know, many of you might have seen this show through the years, Big Bang Theory. And I used to watch this with my family when it came out, I don't know, a dozen plus years ago. And one day I was watching, I was waiting for the family to come home for dinner. And so I just decided to turn on TV. And I remember, you know, throughout the series, you'd see this room and every once in a while I try to look in the background to see, oh, look at the pictures of galaxies and whatever. And I always remember it looked like there's a telescope in one of the pictures. And so I'm watching, waiting for the family. And lo and behold, there's, there's a, a shot of them um, with that telescope in the background. And so I took a pic, so I, whoops, I, I um, took a picture of it and that's the Clark telescope, the 24 inch Clark telescope, that poster on the wall. And of course, then I had to watch all of the series. And in the first series of Big Bang Theory, a poster of the Clark telescope is on their wall. Um, and it's a picture of Leonard Martin, who is a Mars observer. Um, we, the picture I recognized when I saw it. So even, even in pop culture, the Clark telescope um, has, has you know, made an appearance. And so, you know, between all those visitors coming here and then a lot of awareness about Lowell through educational programming, our visitation through the years has really grown from even, even in Percival Lowell's day, he would invite guests to come up on Saturday night to look through the old refractor or the young refractor back then um, because he wanted to inspire people. 
Um, through the years, we had different educational programs, look through telescopes. In 1994, we built a visitor center dedicated for um, educating and exciting people about the stars. And that's the visitor center you've been in. Um, well, that, that proved so successful that in the last few years, um, pre-COVID, we are getting 110,000 visitors a year plus. And for our size, that was, we were maxing out um, because our parking lot and our visitor center were designed for 70,000 visitors a year. So we were getting to where, you know, lines were long, um, there's not enough restrooms, um, people are having to wait just to get in. And so we began a plan to expand the visitor experience, um, a plan that will, that started with, with this facility that I'll talk about in a minute, then continues with a new visitor facility, a large one. So this was phase one of this expansion to where we have more things for public to do, they can spread out, plus what they're doing is really cool. So this is called the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. And Giovanni is the name of a, a family in town that made a major donation. And this thing is so cool. Um, this, this, um, some of you might have seen this, but it opened in the fall of 2019, right before COVID started. Um, and so this is this whole plaza, observing plaza. You notice this hangar. This hangar is normally closed over the telescopes. But at nighttime, we open it up, you roll the whole building, the whole building rolls back on tracks. There's one of the tracks right here. The whole building rolls back and you have six different telescopes here of different sizes, um, different types to look at the night sky. So we have an instant, you, you open the dome and it's instant star party. So you have the 24 inch refractor, which is oh a couple hundred yards from this. We have another telescope, a 16 inch, um, a new or a new 20 inch telescope that we just got a plane wave. Um, and then we've got this plaza. And then of course we have educators with laser pointers and such. So this has really allowed us to um, give visitors a lot more things to do. I wanna just, I'll quickly show you the telescopes um, since you guys might be interested in this. Um, and so here's this, um, the five and a half inch refractor, um, which is great for, you know, wide angle stuff. Um, and, and I wanna use this picture to show one thing. These telescopes were designed for public viewing. They're not research telescopes adapted for the public, like what we did with the 24 inch refractor. And so one of the, one of the characteristics of several of these telescopes is the mount. This mount raises and lowers. And so you can have a tall person looking through eyepiece here, but let's say we have somebody in a wheelchair or a, a kid or a shorter person, we just push a button and the whole telescope will go down and is still focused on the object. Um, and so within seconds, you push a button and, and it's the right level for somebody in a wheelchair and they don't, we don't have to try to get them to stand or you know, hoist them up, they can comfortably view. So that's one of the several adaptations we have with this that makes this really ideal for public viewing. Um, you know, we have one telescope, you still have to crawl, climb a ladder because you'll see it's a, it's a um, Dobsonian, but, but three of these have these mounts that make it really practical. This is another one that has this kind of mount. And this is probably visually the most stunning of these telescopes, this eight, eight inch refractor. And this was designed kind of with a steampunk throwback look. It's kind of a nod to the 24 inch refractor. I mean, it's a modern telescope built in England um, specifically for this. Um, but it's, you know, it's one of these things that, you know, when you look through a telescope, what you're looking at is spectacular. But when you have something like this, that's part of the experience to be able to look through a telescope like that. You know, for the public, it's, it really is part of the experience, this, this really unique telescope. Um, we've got this uh, 14 inch ref reflector. Um, and then we've also got two plane waves. Um, oh, I guess the, yeah, these, these, um, these two plane waves. And these ones don't have eyepieces. We want, we, don't, we want to make sure to give visitors the eyepiece experience because 
when you're looking through an eyepiece, it's just you and what you're looking at. And it's just, as you know, such a connection. But there's also the benefit of being able to teach by using a screen where, you know, we can have an astronomer standing next to the screen and bring up something from one of these telescopes and, and you can teach several people at one time. You can bring up like a nebulae that this astronomer studies and point out its features. So these two, these two telescopes here, the four, the, um, these plane waves are great for doing that. Um, and we've got the 16 inch mead. And then the biggest one is the 32 inch um, Dobsonian. We need a ladder for this, obviously where the eyepiece is. But this is actually our biggest telescope um, diameter wise on Mars Hill. The, the Clark refractor is a lot longer, it's 32 feet, but it's diameter is only 24 inches. So anyways, this, this diversity of telescopes, you know, almost no matter what's up in the sky, we don't even have to spend time setting up. The telescopes are already set up. They're already mounted and set up. Whatever might be up or the changing weather conditions, partly cloudy, you know, we have, the tele we have a telescope for any kind of condition and whatever object we want to look at. So that's turned out to be a really great addition as well as this six or this uh, it's actually a 24 inch plane wave um, that replaced the 16 inch Bowler and Shivens that we had. So this dome is right behind the 24 inch refractor. And this is one that we use a lot for school groups and, and other private functions um, to where, you know, we've got the public up because we're open every night but Tuesday. Um, so the public might be using the other telescopes, but we can have private groups using this one. So I, I, I don't know, I feel like I'm just blabbing on because there's, I think there's so much fun stuff to talk about. But let me just end by looking at the future a little bit. I mentioned that um, phase one of our expansion for the visitor program was to build the Open Deck Observatory. Phase two is a much larger project. It's, um, I think it's now $43 million project. And as the cost of, of supplies changes with our current economy, that price is going up, um, but right now it's $43 million. Plus we're raising money for an endowment um, so that we have money to take care of it after it opens. Um, but this is our Astronomy Discovery Center. It's 40,000 square feet. It's essentially got three stories. And so when you come to the observatory, you're no longer going to park where you used to and go into that visitor center. We're gonna maintain that facility as a place to do um, camps and private programs and conferences and such. But the new Astronomy Discovery Center, it's a, it's a different drive that goes beyond that parking lot. It's a, it's a brand new parking area, as well as this, this will be the entrance right here. Um, three stories, it's got, um, it's got several exhibit spaces and we also have space to expand that to add more exhibit spaces through the years. To me, I, I don't know, it's got a, it a, it's got a 30 foot tall, um, I think it's a 120 degree screen that's gonna be great for looking at um, programming. But to me, one of the coolest things is on the roof, um, what we're calling the, a rooftop planetarium. Because we thought about, you know, do we, do we install a planetarium, a traditional planetarium here, but, but you know, we're, I mean, we're a research facility um, and we've got dark skies of Flagstaff. So we could have a planetarium, but those can be challenging to keep financially viable. Um, we have the real thing, the dark skies here. We've got um, our astronomers here. So we decided to create this open planetarium, quote unquote, open planetarium. And it's part of what's on the top, which is gonna be Gosh, that's, I think, it's, I think it's 30 feet high. So right at tree line, the view is spectacular. And um, that's gonna be, um, I don't know, 120 to, I don't think maybe up to 200 seats, but the seats are gonna be reclined like you have in a regular planetarium, but we're using the night sky. Uh, the seats are heated because it gets chilly up here. <laughs> um, and, and obviously if, if it's raining, we can't use it, but otherwise, or snowing, but otherwise we can use it on any night 
And so we'll have not only the ability to look at the dark skies, but also have um, state-of-the-art AV equipment that we can, you know, point, do stargazing, and then look at the monitor and see what this looks like up close. Um, so this thing is is going up fast. I just took this about two hours ago. Um, it's, if you were up here, you might remember what's called the Jiffy Pop Dome. It's kind of on the behind the visitor center, kind of in the vicinity of where the Pluto Discovery Telescope is. So this, these are the walls going up of, of this new thing. Um, so they're, they're gonna have the major structure done this year. And then next year we'll be outfitting it with, you know, doing the electric as well as the exhibits and such. So the next time you visit, it'll be, it'll be exciting to be able to show you either the progress on this or uh, when it's opened um, because um, it's, 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 I mean, we're designing it to be a world destination, not just a place if you happen to be in Northern Arizona with a destination. So, so anyways, we're really excited about that. And I think to me, Lowell Observatory is this combination of, you know, we've been doing science for a long time. So we've got the history, we've got the current science. So really this continuum, this heritage of science, I'm like Palomar Observatory in Mount Wilson, um, this handful of classic American observatories. But then we also have this outstanding outreach program um, that right now, again, pre-COVID was bringing in, bringing 100 plus thousand visitors a year. Um, we expect this to go up to 300,000 visitors um, within five years of the new visitor center being open. Um, and so, it's going to be. It's really going to be a destination for astronomy education and formal education, as well as learning about the current science that's going on. So, with that, I'll end the program, and I'm going to end it with this slide. This is July 4th, and this is a picture taken in downtown Flagstaff, and in the background is a 24-inch Clark refractor, and the person riding in this car is Apollo 17 astronaut Harrison Schmidt. And Harrison Schmidt was a geologist um, working at the USGS here in town when he was chosen to be an astronaut. And he was the only geologist to walk on the moon. And to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his flight, which is this year, and I thought I'd throw this in since this is the anniversary of Apollo 11, um, we invited him to be the Grand Marshal for our July 4th parade. So here he is riding in Percival Lowell's car. You might've seen this car when you were here, the 1911 Stevens Durier. And our gearheads keep this thing running so we can drive it in parades like this. So when you come up to Lowell, if you haven't seen it, the next time you're here, I'll be glad to show you this car. And then maybe you're here July 4th sometime, you'll see it in the parade. So with that, I'm gonna, I'll stop sharing. Um, let everybody take a breath. And um, I'd be glad to take some questions or chat about Lowell or um, pretty much anything going on here um, or with, the, with astronomy. We're certainly all been following the James Webb images very closely. And one of our sci scientists I mentioned, Will Grundy, has time scheduled on James Webb. I'm not, I think it's next year um, that they're, they're, it's for um, some planetary work. Um, so, so that the images they're getting back from that are amazing. So anyways, um, any questions or comments or anything anybody would like to talk about? Uh, we can do that in chat or if you want to turn your sound on or whatever works. Okay, let, let me jump in with a quick one. Are you scanning the plates yourselves? I, for the Pluto? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, we... we um, our team, uh, Stephen Levine, is leading this charge, working with our archives team. Stephen is one of our astronomers here. And so he's, he's been um, testing a couple different scanners. And in fact, he's got a, a pretty, almost an off-the-shelf off scanner that the resolution is so good that you're able to um, resolve all the detail. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while to do this. Um, but but being able to do it in-house, and especially 
without having to send the plates elsewhere where every time they're moved, the chance of breakage increases dramatically. Um, they're doing it, they're setting it up right in the plate vault that many of you saw. And they have the scanner down there right now and he's been testing it. Testing it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I tried to run down when they scanned the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey plates and I believe they were scanned twice uh, at the Naval Observatory in Flagstaff and at Harvard. Okay. And there was, and there were certainly, um, they looked at different options of how to scan it. Uh, but, but again, the technology is, has oh. improved so much that you don't have to send it off to a special place to do it, which is, which is great because there, there's less chance of, like I said, breakage and other things. But it's, you know, it's taking a while to develop the technique for it. And, it, and as I mentioned, scanning it with all the comments and markings on it and then removing all those to where they're, you know, essentially the original plates. Hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a daunting task. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, you, I, I know you've stimulated a lot on the chat. We're all set to go, go out to Rosecrans Cemetery in Point Loma and look for Burnham. Yeah, I, 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 um, I, I was in San Diego last year for an Apollo 15 event. And um, I really wanted to get over there just to pay homage, but, I, but we didn't have time. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully this coming year, but I, you know, it's amazing. I mean, I mean we all, I think everybody in this group is probably very familiar with Burnham, but the story of his life is really, it's quirky, it's tragic. Um, and, and he's, you know, this marker in his grave is just a very basic marker. Um, you wouldn't know what contributions he made to astronomy. And that's something that we certainly want to change here at the observatory. Mm -hmm. More questions? I remember seeing uh, VM Slifer's uh, uh, spectrograph. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it was, was it, is it technically a spectrograph? I, right. But, but, but anyway, the, uh, and it was, it was sort of in that, in a back room. Yeah, now it's, it's in our collection center. Our collection center was built in 2013 or 14. And so all of our, eventually all of our historic stuff will go in there. There's also, also offices as well as our science library, but also in the middle of the building is an exhibit area. And that's mm -hmm. where Big Red, Percival Lowell's car is normally parked. Oh, yeah. And then there's also exhibit space on either side. And that's where, that's where the spectrograph is, as well as um, a millionaire calculating machine that Percival Lowell's computers used. To, to calculate planet X positions and such. I have a non-technical question, if I may. Sure. I, I, I had read somewhere that uh, the observatory was also like a garden for Mr. Lowell. He would send telegrams and letters to uh, Mr. Tomba asking for zucchini and uh, all kind of garden produce for his kitchen. Is that? Something that's yeah, true. he did. It wasn't it wasn't Clyde Tomba. They didn't overlap, but it was the, the staff that was there when Lowell was there. He loved having a garden. And for those of you who are here, if you remember, you go out of the visitor center and then you walk up the hill to get to the Clark Dome, the 24 inch refractor. That pathway up the hill is where the garden was. We've got some old pictures of it. And he he always loved to brag about the zucchini that he got here. And when he wasn't here, he frequently um, wrote telegrams or letters and, and frequently asked about how the garden was doing and if this year's crop of watermelons were doing well and that sort of thing. And Flagstaff isn't the best place for growing a lush garden, um, but they were able to, you're able to grow certain things like, you know, huge squash and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to unmute you guys, uh, unmute yourselves and ask any questions you like. 
Thank you for the time to give us a lecture. Very nice. We really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. This is nice. I mean, I have fun talking about this stuff. And it's, I, I want to get back to Palomar because I haven't been there in years. I, I, I'm trying to remember the last time. It's been at least 10 years, I think. So I have to wait a little bit longer, I know, but hopefully. Yeah, we might have to wait. But however, if we open it, I'll send you an email right away. Okay. <laughs> And uh, we're hoping maybe you could come down for the 60 inch night if, if we actually have this event. Oh, that'd be great. I, I remember I, it was, I think it was on that trip that um, Mike Murray up at Mount Wilson, um, he gave me a tour of, of Mount Wilson that we went in the solar towers and everything. But there was a, there was a Mount Wilson Friends, I can't remember what the organization exactly okay. is called, but. Um, but they were having an event that night and viewing it in the 60 inch. And the first thing I saw was the Cat Eye Nebula. And I, I about fell over. It was spectacular. <laughs> yeah, the 60 inch with an eyepiece is really good for planetaries. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you, you know, sometimes with a telescope like that, if say, for example, Jupiter is out that particular night, sometimes, you know, given the, the ephemeris of a planet versus a fixed object. Sometimes you can see it, but you can't find it in the telescope. Yeah, right. <laughs> I got a question from Jim Harper. <clears throat> His question was, I presume the annotations on the non-emulsion are on the non-emulsion sides of the plates, but if they aren't, how are the markings going to be removed so that the emulsion will not be damaged? Yeah, the, the markings, I mean, um, and I haven't I haven't examined the plates myself, but as I understand, you always they always wrote on the non-emulsion side for that very reason. And if you write on the emulsion side, you might scrape some of the emulsion off. Um, and so, the writing, in theory, is all on the non-emulsion side. And I think you know the Clyde Tombaugh and later folks who were making the plates. They had a they had a technique for they knew immediately which side to write on. I mean, they always flip the plate the same way and everything. You would have hypered the plates there. What's that? Yes. You would have right. hypered the plates. Uh, yeah. at, Pal at Palomar, they have a separate little building that where they, they used to hyper the plates, which of course is no longer done. That's where the uh, the tungsten filaments are illuminized. Okay. When they, uh, 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 but uh, when they reilluminize mirrors, uh, but we call that little building that used to have the hydrogen hypering process. It's called the Hindenburg. <laughs> well, well, here they they prepped the plates um, in the basement in the dark room first um, to get them in the plate holders and do everything else, but then. In the base, in the bottom floor of the Pluto telescope dome, the, the uh, there's the Pluto telescope dome, the Pluto discovery telescope, the 13-inch astrograph, um, the Lawrence Lowell telescope. Those are all the same thing. Um, there's a bottom floor, then you go up the stairs to get to the telescope. But in the bottom floor, they had a, a focusing table that you put the plate holder with the plate, and then it had a little arm on it, um, and you using a screw, you tightened um, the plate within the holder and the arm would change to where, where, where you were either green or, green or blue or red or whatever. Um, and it was a pretty rustic way of, of focusing the plate, but it, it worked out pretty nicely of getting the right curvature of the plate. But um, Clay Tomba, when he first started doing that, he broke several because it was trial and error. And then on the really cold nights, that could be miserable work. All right, any, any more questions from the group? I, I could do this for all night, but <laughs> I don't know. Are you one hour ahead of us or behind us? We're the same time right now. Oh, okay. You've, you've sprung ahead, but we haven't. Oh. Unless you go to the Navajo reservation. So it can be very confusing for travelers who come into Arizona um, 
and the time might change. And then they go out of the reservation, it changes, but then they Brand get off Cannon. the reservation. Grand Canyon changes this morning. The, the Pluto Discovery Telescope, maybe you've mentioned it because I came in late. Is that an Alvin and Clark telescope or somebody else? Yeah, it's Alvin Clark. It was it was built in the late 1920s. So after Alvin Clark and Alvin Jr., um, it was it was um, Carl Lundin Jr. Who, so his dad was one of the main figures for the Clark. And so it was kind of, they were winding down, but it, it's just, it's a, the telescope is a basic cross axis design. The, the telescope itself was built in house here at the observatory. Um, but the, yeah, the lenses were made by Clark and you know, precisely what they needed to do. They're not, they're 13 inch diameter, but just what they needed. I, I was gonna mention one other, one other thing related to Pluto. Um, some of you might've seen in the last few weeks, um, Clyde Tombaugh's nine inch telescope was up for auction. Um, and it's the telescope that he had built on the farm in Kansas out of the creamery and other farm parts. And um, I visited Clyde's son, Al, um, a couple of years ago, I was visiting him and he had it in his trailer. And the, the will of Clyde and his wife, Patsy, was that that telescope be auctioned off. And so the kids have been trying to auction it for years. At one point, they were, the starting price was 1.2 million. Um, that didn't go. <laughs> but they, they finally um, got it set up in an auction house in Texas. And so it was, the auction was open for 10 days or so. And our development team here at the observatory, I mean, all of us thought, wouldn't it be great to have that telescope? That was the one he was using to make the drawings that he sent to Lowell Observatory that led to him being hired here. Well, our development team put out a call to our advisory board members, to donors, to pledge. And, and so we didn't know what the final amount would be, but we gathered pledges of something like 115,000 and we won the bid. Um, this was just last Saturday. And so over the next few weeks, it's gonna be shipped up to us. And, and the next time you come here, you'll be able to see that telescope. Um, and it's it's just so unique. It was you know it's homemade. You've seen picture it's the classic picture of Clyde with a telescope that says nine inch Newtonian. I think it's written on the side. It's that telescope. And so we're excited to have it here. It is. It was in working order when Clyde. I mean at, at the end of his life. And so we'll probably put it on display as well as hopefully take it out to do observing every now and again. I just wanted to say it was uh, every year we go to the Grand Canyon Star Party and one of our day trips is always to see uh, tour the Mars Hill there. And sure. It's so fun to, once we get into the compound there and inside the gate, we start calling Pluto a planet. <laughs> and so uh, we have um, amnesty from the world that we can do that and then when we go outside the gate, we have to revert to saying that it's the largest dwarf planet. <laughs> but we don't want to get a ticket from the uh, the people oh, yeah, in the, Vienna. Yeah, the police up here. Yeah, that would be in trouble. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, the observatory doesn't have an official policy on what what we call Pluto because it's more what scientists think. Not it's not an institutional decision. It's and and. You know, I think, I think again, most scientists, whether at Lowell or elsewhere who study planets, consider it a planet. And many of them, you know, don't even care about the conversation of what to call it. Um, whereas those dynamicists don't call it a planet. I think it's, I think it's just great for bringing the public in um, to get interested. And also, uh, you know, for me, one of the things that we have to be careful to not do is just because it was discovered here, we don't call it a planet just because of that. Um, and, it, and it gets to the, that implied hierarchy that a planet is somehow you know, more significant than anything else. Um, I, think, I think it's all a great conversation to talk about how science works, how it doesn't work, you know, astronomers' perspectives on things. And, um, and 
you know, the, it's been however many years now, and we still have visitors coming up, coming in that are so upset that Pluto got dumped, uh, as they as they say, and it just cracks me up because it, you know, it's just it's just how it's entered pop culture. On well, that, look like you had a question. There was an airplane flying over, and I couldn't hear. I had to put my ear to the computer. <laughs> I'm outside. I had an airplane going by. I I, I posted. I I chat. I put it on the chat. So. Okay. Well, thank you all for visiting for visiting the observatory when you come to the Grand Canyon Star Party. And and I'll put this out if you're, you know, whether whether you want to plan a group a next group visit or if you're coming individually. Um, I'm Kevin at mold.edu, um, and let me know, and I'd be glad to, you know, give you a behind the scenes look at the place. There's a lot of, there's so many things to do right now at the observatory, but there's also the behind the scenes stuff, like, you know, seeing the Pluto discovery place and, and some of the other stuff. It's like anywhere else, you know, there's the stuff that you see, but there's so many other things in closets and collection center and everything. Um, I'm, I'm always glad to share that. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure some of us will take you up on it. And let's let's stay in touch because, you know, we if, once Palomar opens, we, we will have to figure out something to do. Sure, yep. I'd like the idea of some sort of mutual, you know, maybe our, our, education, our education staff can go and visit um, you guys. It's, it's always a challenge because it's almost like two trips because our staff has grown so much. There's not really a, a day that's closed. But anyways, I'd like to be able to, you know, it's always nice to visit each other to see what's going on and to nerd out. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah there's, there's, there's been a lot of new equipment uh, installed on the observatory. And we, one thing I did notice just, you know, when I was up there, uh, some months ago is without the visitors, the place is maintained a little, you know, it's a little bit cleaner, not as much, you know, janitorial work done, things stay <laughs> nice and neat. Right. And now, you know, now that we're open again, um, they, they've expanded the staffing to maintain that look because, you know, now we have like stickers that visitors will wear. So we know if you paid or not, that sort of thing. But, you know, stickers end up all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that we have a, gosh, before COVID, we had, I think, a grounds crew of, I think, two full-timers. Now we have three full-timers plus an, another that's here for the summer for the busy crowds. And so, um, you know, it's nice, it's nice to get back to some normalcy and bring in more staff and everything. Okay, well, in, unless there are any the final questions from the group, now's your chance. Uh, okay, well, uh, Kevin, again, thank you so much for a great presentation. It was nice to think so warmly about, uh, about Lowell and going back and, and seeing what you've done. Uh, it's, it's, again, so many aspects, it's quite a different place than, than we docents visited, what, I think five or six years ago. Well, it'll be time to start planning the next visit pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, we're ready to go. Yeah. So if there are no more comments or questions, uh, thank you for attending next month. We're not really on an observatory series, but uh, the director of Mount Laguna Observatory is gonna update us on uh, what's going on at Mount Laguna and that, does kind of synchronize with the Julian Starfest that we'll be doing a Mount Laguna tour, probably hosted by um, one of the ex Palomar docents uh, who's now an adjunct professor there. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Kevin, for the great talk. And we'll be in touch and see you all at the next star party in a few days. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.